and just just by documenting the process i'm not even talking about the improvement i'm not talking about the opportunities for like a broad assessment in the portfolio level none of that it's just now you have a single source of truth for your processes welcome to process pioneers the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers key influencers and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process Welcome to another episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I'm the host of Process Pioneers. And in each of these episodes, I get the absolute privilege of sitting down with uh, various BPM practitioners, those that are putting BPM into practice in organizations and reaping significant value um, from what they're doing. And today I have the absolute uh, privilege of sitting down with Mobin Bharati. Now, Mobin is a consulting uh, principal at Digital Twin Consulting and has uh, such an extensive and, and broad background and experience Experience, uh, working with a range of organizations, including government departments. So I'm really excited for this conversation. Mobin, thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks, Daniel, and thanks for the introduction. It's great to be here. So um, what might be good to, to, uh, for us to get started is uh, to give the audience a little bit of context as to who you are, uh, when you were first introduced to the topic of BPM, and then take us on a, on a bit of a journey leading up to what you're doing today. Absolutely. Look, uh, I started as a software engineer in uh, 1996 when uh, I was doing my first degree in uh, software engineering. And then since then, I moved to the business analysis uh, part of that, understanding uh, the diagrams and the, the process maps behind a software engineering project. I was fascinated with the value that those maps and a great understanding of those um, kind of uh, shared knowledge between the different parties can bring to the project. And from there, I moved to consulting. I was a consultant for uh, system implementation in different uh, industries and uh, companies. And um, I did my another degree in, in management to learn more about management practices. From there, I uh, was a business consultant helping uh, mainly the agriculture industry and uh, hotel management um, uh, practices. Uh, and from there, I, I came to Australia in 2009, uh, started as a uh, project manager, program manager, moved to uh, a bit of uh, solution delivery roles. And um, 2015, I uh, jumped on uh, BPM consulting and enterprise uh, architecture consulting. Uh, around 2013, 14, I finished uh, a double degree from Queensland University of Technology in uh, BPM and uh, information technology. So I kind of um, classified all the knowledge and closed the gaps from academic perspective and it helped me quite a lot with my, with my career as well. And since 2018, I started my own consulting firm um, that I support organizations with the BPM uh, and enterprise architecture. And of course, with uh, digital to and off uh, organization um, services. That's great. That's awesome. So what would you say is uh, one of the biggest uh, drivers of BPM? Why do organizations adopt BPM? What triggers that process? Look, um, I think it is a kind of um, general knowledge in BPM practitioners, within BPM practitioners, that everything a business does is a business, business process. That's what is being really executed. As a result of that, you know, every product and service, you know, uh, all the resources, uh, the value it is generating, and also the experience it creates, it all comes from the, the execution of those processes. I think this is well documented by Roger and Dan and Michael Roseman, uh, you know, the, the giants of, of this practice. Uh, so, um, and I've, I've, of course, learned, uh, learned from them. Um, that is the driver behind uh, applying BPM in the organization. Um, the challenge is uh, the understanding of that. Um, generally, um, processes are not seen as like the, uh, the assets, like the strategic assets. They do not have the uh, same class of value as like finance or HR or uh, IT. And as a result of that, they are not properly funded and established in, in the organization. Right. Uh, having said that, the driver behind BPM is, of course, uh, managing the processes, improving the processes, and ensuring you know when, when you when you monitor the performance or compliance or conformance of those processes, you're doing the right thing as you're expected, 
and you're generating the right experience. Yes, right, right. And um, from your experience, what um, in adopting BPM, is it generally, um, is it a top-down approach? Um, can it be done bottom-up? Where, where do you sort of sit on that sort of, in that sort of conversation with um, what's possible and, and um, can you even start a BPM initiative without that um, senior leadership support? Uh, I would say it is, I mean, doable, but how successful it can become is really the question. Mm. Um, like every other management practice, you need that top-down uh, acceptance, endorsement, and sponsorship. Mm. Uh, and, uh, of course, with that comes uh, with the change management, uh, all the resources that are required for such uh, practice uh, to, to be in place, and so on and so forth. You can start from a, a small corner of the organization with a very sort of local support and you can show the value and you can grow from there. I have found this way of implementing BPM very painful and long to uh, kind of achieve some sort of tangible result ac across the whole of the enterprise. The top-down approach, of course, with that executive sponsorship uh, from the top uh, really enables BPM to go uh, across the whole uh, enterprise and support um, multiple initiatives at the same time and maximize the value that it brings to the organization. Right, right. So when you're trying to, I guess, um, garner that support from senior leadership, because we do have a lot of people listening to the, the podcast who um, maybe they're working in an organization where they don't have that buy-in or that sponsorship just yet. Um, how, do you, how do you communicate to senior leadership um, about BPM, about the value it provides? What sort of language should you be using? Um, how should you approach that? I think uh, one thing is well documented is about the value that a BPM brings uh, to the organizations. If you look at any white paper, any uh, academic research paper, uh, you know, the, the value is there. However, the value has not been um, kind of uh, put into numbers. So you do not have um, a, lots of papers out there that kind of get you to if you implement BPM in this fashion, you get 25% return uh, right. or, or improvement in your process, or you have like 50% uh, you know, improvement on the other process. That information is not quite there. And the, the support I think for the, um, the BPM practitioners to go and use the uh, worldwide uh, BPM implementation um, case studies to, to convince their executives is not quite that. So that's one thing I think we need to kind of work a bit more on that and then generate those numbers and then publish those numbers and then results out there to help other uh, BPM practitioners to, to go there, um, to, to use them and go and talk to their executives saying, we have the similar problem. If we do the same thing, we can achieve the same result. I think that that is like an easy way of doing it. But the hard way of doing it, I think, is to pick one project that has um, uh, create, uh, always creating a, a, a lot of problem for the organization. One of the processes, end-to-end -end processes or a local process, really doesn't matter which scope you pick. But as, as long as there is visibility over the improvements you make, that creates the case for, um, you know, the conversation with the executive to get more buying to get more resources and uh, attention to, to, to this topic. Um, so really you have, I, I think, two approaches. Um, first one is easier and the second one is a little bit harder and takes a little while to, to achieve some results. Yes, right, right. And when you've identified that area of the, the organization that does need a lot of improvement or that there is a lot of opportunity there, um, how do you define um, what's possible when working on that process. I'm assuming that when you're talking to these senior leaders, um, you, you do need to present tangible figures and, and this is what we're hypothesizing. This is the potential gains. Where do these potential gains come from? How, how, how do you define what's possible? Because I, I understand, you know, you can, you can make incremental improvements to a process. You can also radically transform something so that it's completely different to how it's ever been done before. So how do you define kind of what your tar targets are? 
Mm. I guess uh, if, you, if you look at the uh, return of investment of those um, uh, BPM uh, projects, uh, and if you only look at the financial returns, there are only three types of financial returns that you can kind of uh, project for a, um, for a process improvement. Uh, one is when you save uh, cost of executing the, the project. Um, that's relatively easy to calculate when you come up with a, a future state a process, then you can kind of calculate based on some assumptions and uh, some facts that you have uh, access to. The, the second one is a, a little bit more difficult, which is about additional revenue, additional value that that uh, process can, can create. Then you need to make more assumptions and then um, the, the environment can change. And so your assumptions can become untrue and then the value may not be there after you make those changes. And the third one is about new revenue. You know, when you kind of um, design a process from scratch or redesign your process and then or, or transform it to a, to a new model where then you can um, gain a new revenue. For that, you need to take a lot of risks and uh, even bigger assumptions. Um, we, we take that approach in the analysis of the process. And when we uh, establish our process landscape, the, the architecture, and also the portfolio, we look at the processes with um, the different um, kind of parameters that uh, we are interested in. You know, if they are complex, if they are, um, you know, uh, high volume, they are high risk, uh, high resource, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then with that, as we uh, analyze those processes, it helps us to kind of rank which area, which process is our uh, area of focus next. And, and we can have a pipeline of projects, if you like, by, by doing so. Uh, from there, when we dive into those processes and do further analysis uh, using, of course, different techniques and methods, uh, we, we also look at uh, the, the future state and how it will either increases the revenue, reduces the risk, or reduces the, the resource consumption, so on and so forth. And then from there, we can do the calculations. Um, I think if you we're talking about the hard savings, the hard savings come from when you do actually real cost saving of the process, the first uh, approach. But then um, uh, it's not always about it. Then, for example, you want to gain a bigger market share. Uh, so uh, then it's, it's additional revenue from the existing process. Or so you want to open a new market. It's a new product, new process that mm. you go to the third. So different approaches for each one. It's, it's relatively easier to justify the cost savings one. Mm. Mm. Um, that's one. The other thing is um, the approach to kind of look at the process improvement of transformation generally. If, if you eliminate uh, first... The, the steps that are not required, the steps that actually are redundant and there's no value at, um, uh, you know, uh, activity happening. If you eliminate that, that's like the cheapest way of improving the process. From there, then you go to standardization where you reduce the variations of the process. Then you do all kind of optimization where you make each step like high performance, low risk, et cetera, et cetera. And from there, then the digitization of the process using all kind of software and technologies and workflow management systems and then the automation there you actually eliminate the role of people executing yes. those processes and replace them by by software and bots and so on and so forth so as you see the the elimination is the cheapest and as you go towards the automation it becomes more expensive to implement right however the value is is different than, than you generate so you can look at the cost benefit analysis of that uh, and then pick the best approach for that improvement. Uh, right. Yeah, that's great. And and obviously there are, there are organizations out there that have adopted BPM, but maybe on a, a small scale um, on an individual project, um, they're looking to, I guess, gain some, some quick wins, some small wins there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are organizations that are further along the maturity journey, the process maturity journey, and, and they've adopted an enterprise-wide approach where um, it's cross-functional, they're seeing their, their value streams from end to end. Um, how important, I guess, what, what is, um, why is it so important to have that end-to-end -end view? Uh, obviously, that's a huge value that comes from BPM. Um, and I think for organizations out there that are still playing on a project-to-project -project level, 
on level, um, they're maybe they're not realizing the full potential um, of BPM um, without that end-to-end -end view. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think uh, when, when you go project by project, you're actually limiting yourself with the value that you can, uh, you know, uh, realize from the, um, the continuity of those uh, activities. BPM mm -hmm. brings all the process improvement projects together and ensures the continuity of the value generation mm -hmm. of BPM is maintained. Uh, you know, as for, for each project, you need to stand up a business case, you need to get funding, you need to, you know, get multiple approvals, you need to establish a project board, and then you do that project. The project is over, uh, the project team usually go away or assigned to other projects, and then uh, there, is, there is an interruption between one project to the other. If the BPM at the enterprise level, when you look at the end to end, you actually ensure continuity and you always have something in the pipeline to kind of continue that uh, value add activity as, as mm -hmm. BPM. So um, the quick wins are good, uh, but quick wins are uh, also short term. They're like, um, uh, they're not a proper treatment, if you like. It's like uh, someone has a headache and you give them a panadol. But if that headache is caused by a, a bigger issue, then the mm. panel doesn't do the job. Though it's right. a quick win, right? Mm. So a lot of quick wins, um, you know, are not a long-term solution for yes. improving the uh, process performance or reducing the risk, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. And, and would you say that is where bad processes come from um, is a lot of, band-aid fixes over time because I, I think there are organizations out there large organizations that um, you, if they looked at their processes that they're, they're, they're very uh, slow or clunky or um, inefficient is that because it, it is just um, there has been very incremental changes over time without zooming out and seeing the big picture or where, where, do, where do you think bad processes come from? I think that's one reason. It's layers of layers of layers of patches on top of each other. And then uh, if you look at, you know, BPM best practices, this on its own is not a good practice uh, to, to do these patches and patches on top of each other. Um, that, that's one reason. And then uh, when, when you do so, it happens over the time. And the people with different mindsets and different approaches and different skill set have actually touched the process uh, as a result of that, you know, you see some patches have been done really well, but some patches are not so well. And, you know, that even inconsistency in those layers uh, will create additional work, additional, uh, you know, waste to, to the whole of uh, the, the, the process uh, performance. When, when you zoom out, of course, uh, you have, um, you need to have the right skill set as well. You know, you need to have process architects, business architects with capacity to kind of look at the end-to-end -end, can understand, observe the complexity of that end-to-end -end, and then break it down into the smaller pieces where each piece can be uh, managed, improved, and, um, and uh, executed. So you need to kind of look back, but you need to have the skill set. Uh, of course, there is a shortage of skill set, uh, such a skill set in the market. Uh, uh, business architects, uh, process architects with such capability are quite rare in the market. And then uh, if uh, organizations find them, they don't let them go easily. So <laughs> that, that is like the, 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 the issue with, um, with the, the skill set. Um, the other issue about the back processes is uh, the, the legacy uh, systems and technologies. You know, right. uh, some organizations, many organizations still use technologies that are not um, contemporary uh, kind of um, technologies, um, software um, models uh, and um, the database models and all the technology layers belong to 2000, 2005, kind of era and mm -hmm. then they do not support a lot of things that um, companies want to do in 2021. Right. So that's another reason I think that uh, a lot of bad processes are created because the technology, do, the, the existing technologies, legacy systems do not support a good process. Right, right. 
Great. And, and let's just say that, um, you know, an, the organisation has um, received that buy-in, that sponsorship from the, the senior leadership um, and they, they're setting up a, a centre of process excellence um, and um, they're, they're recruit, recruiting the right resources, they're building out their team. What, what are some of the biggest challenges an organisation is going to face um, when adopting BPM, implementing BPM and, and ramping that up uh, enterprise-wide? Mm. Um, I think BPM has this um, uh, kind of um, reputation as being slow. Uh, and uh, it comes from the experience of people who have seen um, ineffective VPN implementation. Right. Uh, in, in, in many uh, projects, we've seen uh, how BPM could not actually uh, deliver as expected, uh, could right. not catch up with the speed of the project or the changes. And instead of becoming a partner to, to business, uh, it has become a blocker. So that is like the general feeling, if you like, in many of the organizations that I've worked with. Um, and uh, they, I think one other thing is about uh, the documentation is seen a bit too heavy when you do proper BPM. Right. Uh, I think that comes from um, understanding or, or doing BPM as an afterthought. Uh, you know, uh, we have decided on implementing um, software X, Y, Z, and that's decided. Now we build the process around it. Right. So okay. the process thinking, the process uh, design all comes down after the decision uh, uh, of a software. Uh, right. Computer. So it should be the other way around. So mm -hmm. you think about the process as everything you do in a business is a process. Mm -hmm. And then you need a software to support that process. You need people mm -hmm. to support that, the skills and technologies and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the biggest challenge is to kind of get uh, to win people over uh, with a good BPM. Right. And um, it, it, of course, takes a lot of effort because people come from, you know, experiences of bad BPM um, and um, many might not have seen a, a good BPM implementation. So the trust is not there about, oh, mm -hmm. the BPM can help us. And um, so I, I guess that, that makes it even harder, though the resources are allocated, the uh, the Center of Excellence has been established, a software has been procured for you know, process modeling, analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But then the, the people side of VPM becomes a bit more challenging because people need to really believe and support uh, to, to, to make VPM successful. Mm -hmm. and, and I've heard that um, sometimes the, the person that's really driving the initiative will um, uh, will completely change their language um, knowing that some of the language in business process management can be trigger words for some people because mm. that it, when they hear that word um, that as you were saying they've got all of these preconceived ideas of what that means um, and, and you don't want um, to make any sort of obstacles for you before you're, you've even gotten started. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, process consultants join and then redundancy happens, right? So it doesn't resonate as a good practice in people's mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that needs to be, I think, revisited. And then the, the, the process consultants join because there is a need for improvement in the process performance. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, depends on the organization objective. Of course, there could be redundancies, it could be a little job cuts, and so on and so forth. But that was not the objective. The objective mm. was to improve the process. Um, so uh, there is a bit of work uh, left in the change management part of the BPM. And I think, mm. uh, yeah, uh, it is like a, one of the biggest challenges of BPM practitioners. Mm -hmm. And um, despite all of these challenges, um, obviously organizations uh, do invest 
um, into uh, resources and, and technology and, and people um, when it comes to business process management because, um, you know, there has been significant value delivered through BPM initiatives um, and, and it is well documented that, um, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, maybe they can be more, more tangible evidence mm. of uh, in case studies, but um, the reason why organisations are throwing money at it is because um, the people that understand the, where the value is, um, they they want to um, and, and, uh, they want to adopt it as an organisation. So, do do you have? I, I guess um, what is possible with BPM? Um, do you have any sort of examples or, or stories you can share where um, a BPM was adopted, and um, you know whether it it uh, significantly reduced waste or um, it opened up new revenue opportunities. Do you have an example or two you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look, I, I can give you a very good example of uh, recent work. Um, we looked at an organization with their uh, uh, processes and they had like loads of process documents in all kinds of formats all over the place in different um, you know, placeholders, uh, multiple versions, very, very complex stuff. For example, if you wanted to know what is the latest process, you couldn't find it. Though there were like many versions of that same process were floating around. Right. Um, McKinsey has done a research about the value um, of a proper uh, knowledge management system. Uh, in place. Uh, they uh, have um, kind of measured um, and realized that people spend about 20% of their time looking for information. Wow, that's crazy. So uh, part of that information um, kind of search is about what is it that I'm doing? How do I fit into the bigger picture? Mm. What is my team role? What is my function or what is my department role and how we kind of do the handover of our work to the next group okay that is that is a uh, need for a process model a proper documentation what my team and i did was to consolidate all that into a bpm software so we created a single source of truth for all the processes and then we documented around 500 business processes at different levels from the top, level one, level zero, depends on what methodology you adopt, to level four. And um, from there, we have about 500 process models. We have measured from um, uh, uh, January this year, how many times people have visited and used those processes. And we also measured uh, how much time people used to spend before they had these process models and after they had these process models to gain an understanding of what's going on and what needs to change. So we kind of created a current and up-to-date as is state for those many processes that are always available. Now, it has saved something around 3% of the time of about 1,000 people. And then you can easily put that into a calculator and then realize the, the financial gains as well as the time gains mm. of this. And just, just by documenting the process, I'm not even talking about the improvement, I'm not talking about the opportunities for like a broad assessment in the portfolio level, none of that. It's just now you have a single source of truth for your processes. People do not go around and ask people to just go there, they fetch, search for that document, fetch that document, look at that, and it is a shared understanding between everybody. It mm -hmm. reduces 3% of 1,000 people. That's amazing. So we've measured that and then we've reported that and it was like even an eye opener for, for us. <laughs> even, even when you do document the process and standardize that and make it a shared knowledge across the board, mm. you, you, you start gaining value from that. And it is a... It is an asset, right? A process mm -hmm. model, a document is an asset. So you have created an asset and that the asset has this return of investment for you every time you need it, like yes. any other asset. 
Yes, that's right. And, and you know, you've got um, people that are leaving organisations and they've been there for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, if, if they're walking out that door with uh, information stored in their head, um, you know, you're going to be um, having to train up um, a new resource um, on a process that no one really knows how it was done because it was never sort of documented down somewhere. Um, and so I think, you know, there's many, there's many reasons why um, simply like starting step one and, and documenting the processes, there, there's so much value already before you even start analyzing the data there. And now you have this process as your current state, you want to run any project. Mm. You've got your current state process models done, right? Mm. So even if you want to start a project, you don't have to spend so much time on the discovery. Mm. Part of that discovery has been done for you because you, you don't need to do those process mappings and workshops and validations and all that stuff. It's done for you. You have a very, very strong starting point for yes. your project. It reduces the time of your project because you don't have to spend that time to generate this knowledge. And as you change and then you kind of implement your project, whatever it is, if there is any change in your processes, you produce those changes at in your models as part of your process. And when you close your project, your processes are updated again. Now you have your kind of to be model or future state as implemented become the new current state. And then you can kind of see the cycle of that process model and VPM very nicely. Yes, yeah, that's right. That's right, that's great. And um, looking at the last 18 months, it's obviously been a very uh, turbulent uh, time for a lot of organizations. I mean, I mean, now uh, we're in uh, September in, in 2021. And so um, we are, um, uh, organizations, I guess, have adapted and pivoted. Um, for, for some organizations, they've been able to thrive over the last 18 months. For some other organizations, it has um, been a, um, a, a struggle and a bit of a journey for them. How has BPM played a role in the last 18 months? Do, have, you, have you seen BPM kind of board up the priority list or have you seen it kind of pushed to the side as a bit of like, oh, that's the cherry on top type thing? Mm -hmm. uh, I think a number of things uh, I, can, I can talk about. One is um, when we were working in offices, um, we were in uh, kind of close proximity. If we needed anything, we just could reach out to the next person and say, okay, how do we do this? How do we do that? Um, now we are working from home. Um, we've lost that uh, direct access. Uh, and we, when you look at people's calendars, it's like fully booked. It's difficult to get hold of people. Um, so having a process model and a proper documentation in place at least gives you the confidence that you know, you, you know the steps, you know what comes next and what sort of decisions should be made. Uh, it helps everyone across the board to uh, kind of continue doing the job. That's one. Mm -hmm. The second one is, uh, again, when we were working in the office, uh, in many industries, they still rely on paper. Right. Uh, when you work from home, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. you, know, you cannot physically move a paper from one place to another. So then everything became kind of digital all of a sudden. Right. And then uh, in the absence of this, the, the processes, though you can create a lot of content in digital formats, but you actually don't know where uh, they, those contents go and who does the next steps. Again, with a proper documentation of the process, you can be confident though you have digitized those processes kind of by force of this situation, but you can continue doing the work. And then you can identify the areas for improvement because then you see, oh, we produce these content over here, invoices over here, but no one is actually looking at them. Mm. There's no one to go and actually issue those invoices or uh, you know, go and collect the money and so on and so forth. So these areas have uh, been quite challenging, I think, in, um, in the organizations um, uh, experiencing this uh, COVID situation in the last 18 months. And then BPM has become a priority for many organizations. I think even in the um, 
software selling space of VPN, there has been a spike of uh, companies uh, wanting buy, to buy more or better VPN software. Right. Because they realized, you know, doing it in Visio, PowerPoint, or Word, those sort of uh, basic tools mm -hmm. cannot help them with this kind of uh, structure of working, or you know, new ways of working, if you like. Right, right. Okay, okay. It's very interesting. I think, you know, it's um, a lot of organizations have been forced to understand, well, how, how are we delivering value? Because supply chains are being disrupted and, and um, you know, you've got, you've got entire office buildings filled with employees that all of a sudden are spread out across the country. And I know uh, in New South Wales at the moment, um, a lot of people are working from their home offices. And so um, you've got to, organizations do have to think of um, how are we going to continue to do to deliver our service or how are we going to continue to, to deliver more value um, with this new um, I guess format of working mm -hmm. um, and I, th I think another thing that um, as a consumer as a customer um, you're engaging with multiple organizations throughout your day um, and you're you know if, if you're if you're in interacting with one um, organization and you're having a certain level of experience mm -hmm. and then you, you start interacting you, you jump off that phone call you pick up another to the next one and it's a, a very different or, or fragmented uh, process or journey um, you know I guess that, that that also puts pressure on organizations to um, I, I guess um improve their processes based on um, not even just their competitors, but um, the, the, the general um, experience that we as consumers are getting across the board um, mm -hmm. from financial service institutions, from utility organisations, from, um, you know, various government departments that um, have invested a lot in, into that. Um, would you say that that is something organisations need to do more of is understanding, well, um, maybe not necessarily our competitors, but but what? How are um, other verticals or sectors, industries? How do they deliver value? How are they doing this process? Mm -hmm. uh, look, uh, the organizations, companies, you know, businesses, enterprises exist for their customers. Mm. Right? The customer pays for all the things that an organization does eventually. Mm. Uh, mm. So, uh, if the customer effort goes up. And the satisfaction goes down, then the customer will look for another provider mm. because you know the customer has just so much loyalty to a to a business, mm. to a provider of uh, I don't know uh, energy or uh, grocery or you name it, right? Mm. So each organization need to look at everything that they do is to make sure that they deliver that value to the customer. And in return, it can be paid for those services mm. and products. And all of that is done through their business processes. Mm. Um, therefore, there's no real other way. If you mm. want to increase your customer experience, make sure you retain your customers, you get your uh, new customers for your, uh, for your product and services. You really need to look at how you can improve your processes and make sure that you know the experience that you're generating for your customers or business partners yes who help you to kind of deliver those uh, services are um, seamless and consistent and and easy to deal with and the customer feels like respect there and, and all those uh, parameters that you know customer expects from a from a business um, i think um, if if you put that into the perspective a lot of organizations do it already um bpm is very well understood i think in the um in the mining industry in the automate uh, auto uh, the, the car making industry the, you know because uh, it's not only about creating a product or a delivering service but also to to do it in a very optimized way mm. the margin of the profit is very small and if they get it wrong then they lose the profit and then they produce a product that the customer doesn't like so it's going to be like multiple wastes if they do not like it this is very tangible in uh, manufacturing wow. uh, you know uh, industries the industries that they 
create uh, physical products. When you talk about the service industry, uh, and the service is, of course, delivered to people, uh, you're talking about feelings, uh, the, the emotions, the, the way that people receive the product and understand the product or the service. And that part, uh, I think, in the service industry, I think there is a little, little bit more work uh, needed to kind of um, optimize the way BPM can, can provide such experience, can provide such uh, high quality. Right, right. And, and talking about, I guess, um, optimizing that customer experience, um, obviously there's a, um, you've got your internal processes, the ones that your um, employees will be um, following or, or whether they're automated through bots or things like that. And then you've got the, the customer journey. Is that a 50-50 split in terms of um, how much emphasis you should be giving on um, sort of the internal versus the external processes? Um, or is it more weighted towards the internal because you can actually have a better idea of what's going on? Or, or should there be more of an emphasis on the external? I guess uh, I do not agree with this external internal split. Right. I think the focus should be on the quality of um, whatever we're doing. And then we look at the, the parameters that uh, help us to understand the quality of the product as it, as it is, um, or, or the quality of the service. For example, if you have a, a process that uh, interacts with the customer, mm. either through um, a phone call or email or a letter or a portal, and then... Uh, you receive like uh, negative feedback from your customer about that interaction that actually demonstrates a low quality in what, what's happening. Right. It could be an internal process where, for example, uh, you submit um, requests for approval internally, and then it kind of takes forever to receive those approvals. Uh, and as a result of that, there will be consequences on the, on the following actions because there is a very long delay in, in, that, mm. in that approval process. Though it is internal, but um, you know, it actually demonstrates low quality in that process. I guess if, if the focus be becomes on the quality of the work and then elevates the quality to a level that fits the organization needs, that would help. And uh, I guess the, um, the uh, consequences of that would be uh, of course, cost savings, uh, retention of the, the uh, skills and people in the organization, and so on and so forth. The other way that uh, some uh, companies have done it in the past is they focused on the cost savings. And as a result of that, people walked out of the door and the quality dropped. Right, right. So I think um, the, the approach uh, of BPM to focus on quality and ensure that the quality of the activities there is, uh, is a bigger, more important factor that, than looking at the internal, external facing processes. Yes, okay, right, right. And now when we, um, I guess, look towards the future um, of BPM, um, over the last um, 15 years, 20 years, you would have seen um, uh, quite a, a change over the years in terms of uh, methodologies and frameworks and technology and, and um you know, the role that a BPM specialist or a process design lead plays in an organisation. But when we look towards the next two, three, five years, um, where, what sort of trends are you noticing and where do you feel organisations should be investing their time, effort and energy? Mm. I think uh, from a skill set perspective, uh, it leans toward knowing more of technologies that are coming to the market and then becoming like pro uh, prominent in the market, like, uh, you know, all the um, process intelligence capabilities. Uh, if um, you like about process mining, uh, mm -hmm. the machine learning and mm -hmm. uh, AI that can really help organizations understand the patterns of work mm -hmm. and uh, kind of fetch all this data and then make meaningful uh, insights mm. from the so quickly they can take action immediately on the trends that they pick up. So the skill set around those uh, tools, technologies, methodologies 
um, are very important. The other um, key skill set, I would say, process thinking mm -hmm. and the, the kind of high level understanding of how BPM can help organization, where it can help. Um, it is also uh, something that will become a bit more uh, on demand. Mm. Uh, that's from the, the skill set. The, the technologies are changing every day. Uh, you know, uh, you have a lot of task mining, process mining tools mm. uh, become uh, becoming very um, very successful in the market. Um, mm. uh, in addition to that, like the reporting tools, um, the process intelligence software mm. uh, are quite important. And of course, the traditional tools like um, you know a process modeling tool that can really uh, produces high quality process and share them uh, to a wider group of uh, stakeholders of that process. Mm -hmm. I think we'll stay around. Uh, one thing I, I like to say is we, we, we should not forget about the manual steps mm -hmm. when we talk about technology, right? Uh, not all steps of all processes have a digital footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at um, you know uh, traditional organizations that there are many of them still, operating in, in the market. Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, they have processes that many steps of them, they are manual. Mm -hmm. There is no kind of trace of any of those activities in their core systems. Mm -hmm. And when we focus on the process improvement part of that, if you only look at the system related processes, we are leaving people behind. Right, right. Only makes their lives more difficult to deal with an optimized system process, if you like. Yes. So it needs to be considered, I think, as people and, and technology as enablers of the process. Yes. And then, of course, whenever you, for example, automate, you can kind of replace these resources because of higher efficiencies or other, other matters that are important for, for an organization. Yes. Um, so I think we, we new technologies that are coming to the market, um, we, we should not lose sight of uh, the people side of the... Yes, uh, yeah. I guess there, there is a lot of excitement um, when it comes to RPA and, and you know, automating things and, and seeing significant value that um, you, I guess you can see why that there is so such a push in that direction um, because... Um, you know, some organizations have seen significant value, but um, I, I guess there is also the concern there that um, if, if you're just trying to copy what another organization is doing without understanding, well, how do we need to apply that technology? Will, will that work for us in the same way? Or do we need to think about it slightly differently? Um, you know, it's, it, it's not just about um, rinse and repeat, um, you need to understand your context, where you're coming from, um, bef like when adopting these technologies. Yeah, hence, you know, each organization has uh, its own uh, BPM strategy. Mm. You cannot just copy and paste from uh, another organization, even similar industry, even similar size, but the challenges mm. are different. As you said, you really need to look at the particular challenges and the options that you, uh, you have to really tackle. If you just copy and paste someone else's strategy, it doesn't probably achieve what, what you, you expect from them. Yes, yes, that's right. And for someone listening to this uh, conversation and um, maybe you've, you've piqued an interest in them, they want to learn more about BPM, they, they want to, um, I guess, embark on that journey in their organisation, um, where do you? Where should they go to learn more? Do, do they need to? Are there online resources, or should they should they be looking for a mentor? Um, should they be be speaking to external consultants? Like for someone that wants to uh, like really consider BPM for their organization, where should they be going? I think there are very good forums uh, online and um, uh, kind of in real life if you like, uh, <laughs> that people can go to. Uh, online, you know, there's so many uh, good channels, you know, Process Pioneers, uh, if you're familiar with Daniel, <laughs> is a very good place with lots of resources. <laughs> I personally learned quite a lot from, you know, uh, the, the interviews you've done, uh, this. I listened to uh, many of them. Uh, then, for example, you talk to Michael Roseman or uh, Marcello uh, from... Uh, 
uh, University of Melbourne, or uh, Roger or Dan or Alec. You know, th these are the guys who've really done it, really thought about it, wrote about it. They have books, mm -hmm. they have papers, uh, they have been in the industry. And then you listen to them, you, you learn so much. Then you, you listen to the practitioners, people are actually doing those projects on the ground. Mm. And they give you a different perspective. So mm. listening and watching, um, you know, process pioneer um, episodes uh, being really helpful. The other one is if you uh, can find a mentor, someone who has done it before or still doing it, mm. and uh, kind of have learned it in the hard way, then you mm. can just touch base, connect, and then have some sessions here there mm. to kind of bounce ideas and then uh, kind of seek for feedback and uh, learn from there. Um, when, when I was in Brisbane, there was this uh, Brisbane VPN uh, uh, roundtable mm. that used to be run once a month and was in person. You had to go to a, uh, a venue, which is very interesting in this <laughs> day and age, right? But you, you would go there and then uh, there was a speaker, there was um, a, a community of VPN uh, either practitioners or people who were interested in BPM. I remember I, for example, participated in one of the Alex Sharp's uh, workshops. Uh, it was like 2013, if I remember correctly. Mm. And it, it was so amazing, it was so eye-opening. And it was like a big crowd of people. And mm. since then we've been connected you know, LinkedIn, following him, uh, his posts and all that. So mm. the more you, you connect to uh, people who share uh, similar interest in BPM and stay in touch and follow them, you, you learn more. Mm. Mm. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, well, Mobin, thanks for sitting down with me today. Um, I've certainly been uh, gleaning a lot and learning a lot from, from your experiences. And um, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. I know that our um, audience, the people that will be listening to this, will um, learn a lot from you as well. So I just want to thank you um, for catching up with me today. Thanks so much, Daniel. It's been a pleasure.